is is uh, Andrew still here? I'm ready to roll. He is. Yeah, I'm here. Do you want me to start up? I think you need to start. That would be lovely. Okay, okay I'll share my I'll share screen and go. Okay, so now we're moving into surveillance and amnesia, and you'll see how this medieval relationship to this works. So, and I'm not really. Here's the Boethian Wheel of Fortune, which is in a kind of a way a disturbing gaming image. Um, I'm not really Boethius. My name's Andrew Prescott from the University of Glasgow. I'm a historian of the Middle Ages who works with medieval manuscripts. And I became involved with the entanglement activity through a chance meeting with Johnny at an event in Dublin last year. And I'm very much valued being part of the discussions. It's been fascinating. I'm attracted to the Middle Ages, if this will do what time we get, do what it's supposed to do, um, because medieval thought and culture challenges contemporary assumptions. It does exactly what Johnny was just saying. It really challenges a lot of our mechanistic uh, modern assumptions. It's striking how Leotard's discussion of language and communication in just gaming frequently revolves around binaries between classical Greek and modern Enlightenment ideas. I think the Middle Ages introduced completely different models into the discussion, which go beyond simplistic models of paganism or orality. In our entanglement discussions, we talked about medieval maps and the way in which Mappa Mundi, like this famous example from Hereford Cathedral, made in about 1300, were not simply geographical diagrams, but represented understanding of the history and fate of the universe and attempted to display both spatially and temporarily human and divine knowledge in one picture. The map is bounded by borders representing death as a reminder that both the body and the physical world would end. East is at the top of the map because that was where Christ would appear at the second coming. The abundant illustrations on the map embody understanding of human and divine history in ways that suggest very different conceptions of how temporality works. In all world maps, a striking feature are the exotic creatures that are shown in different parts um, of, the, uh, uh, of the diagram. Uh, this example is the Ebsdorf world map, uh, which also dates from the 13th century, which was formerly in Hanover, but destroyed, unfortunately, um, in the Second World War. And when you look at the legendary creatures uh, that are shown in world maps like this, you can see the medieval mind contemplating natural history, the nature of being human, and the, 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 the scope of salvation and redemption, the nature of divinity. The categorization of different forms of life raised questions about the nature of salvation and the extent to which God worked, the way in which God worked. And in our entangling discussion, we became interested in how these creatures shown in medieval world maps figured in medieval thoughts because monsters and imaginary creatures abound in medieval art but their function is not purely decorative this is a book of church law produced for a monastery at smithfield in london which is now in the british library but the illustrations aren't what we might expect in a volume concerned with law about the church the illustrations show popular stories they show scenes in which natural order has been reversed and the world turned upside down. So apart from these uh, merry monsters here, you can find pictures of ducks hunting and executing a dog, turning things back to front. Or another dog who's dressed as a bishop preaching a sermon to a flock of birds. A woman fighting with a wild man beneath a strange bird monster. And rabbits arrest, try and execute a dog, their normal enemy. 
Um, this whole process of the rabbits executing a, a trial seems like a subversive comment on the law, the content of the text. But this is more than just carnivalesque playfulness. It's about a relationship to language and writing, which is very different to the closed situation described by Leotard in day one of Just Gaming. This, these illustrations are about the role of memory. Modernity stigmatized memory as mechanical and uncreative with learning by rote, the lowest form of intellectual activity. But in the Middle Ages, memory was considered the wellspring of creativity. Scholars would memorize books, but the purpose of that memorization was to enable the book to be ref refigured, reimagined and interrogated anew from different directions. Memory enabled texts to be considered in a different order so that new textual cross connections could be identified. Biblical texts might be learned so they could be recited backwards or mentally rearranged or completely new meanings identified. And this partly explains the many extraordinary creatures and outlandish images that crowd the margins of medieval manuscripts. From the 12th century, ancient mnemonic techniques were used to assist memory. If you remembered which pages had the trial of the dog on, you might more easily remember which law text was which. Outrageous images would make pages easier to remember. The images we're using for our avatars here are taken from various medieval manuscripts and many were intended to help in memorializing the texts uh, of religious, uh, uh, religious texts such as the Psalms. This medieval process of memory was more than learning a text. It was a process of ingestion, of digesting the text so that it lives within you, becomes corporeal and is born anew. In the Middle Ages, memory enabled books to be synthesized in new forms with new connections. Medieval authors frequently used the metaphor of the bee collecting pollen and making honey for their work in memorizing texts and creating fresh understandings. Medieval art of memory and the memory techniques used are discussed by Mary Carruthers in her Book of Memory. She describes how medieval scholars sought to live and move through their memorized texts. One of the most famous memory techniques discussed by Carruthers is the use of mnemonic architecture by visualizing text as a series of interconnected rooms remarkable feats of memory could be achieved. These kind of images of memory seem to me to connect with Lyotard's discussion in many ways. The active engagement with a memorized text and the rejection of the text as a fixed written object seems to answer Lyotard's concern about writing being too circumscribed and text too fixed. Part of what Lyotard stigmatizes is a view of the text which sees it as fixed and immutable, with the writer restricting the opportunities for gaming and reimagining the text. The medieval idea of memory, of ingesting the text so it lives within you, is a way of escaping those prescriptions. This seems to me to connect with the way in which we visit digital culture. Since the time of Charles Babbage, we've seen computers as a way of doing mechanical tasks more quickly. The assumption has been that by freeing the mind from routine tasks, it enables creativity. But does the medieval experience suggest that profound and creative memorization is more creative than dumping our memories to a hard drive? Does our reliance on computing as a memory prosthetic create collective amnesia? And does that amnesia through its technical dependence drive us into surveillance societies. This is not an argument against technology, but rather a suggestion that we might imagine other models of technology beyond that of making repetitious tasks more efficient and increasing productivity. As mentioned, one medieval memory technique was to envisage complex texts as buildings and to link texts to rooms. We can imagine moving through Boethius as if through a palace, exploring rooms and corridors in different orders, taking different routes 
through. In this way, Boethius could become a game. The spatial metaphors, which are fundamental to so much gaming, could map out a new form of mental universe. Ritual can also be a way of training and shaping memory. One of the other areas on which I work is the history of Freemasonry. The earliest Freemasons received training in the art of memory, which was probably a complex architectural mnemonic. The elaborate secret rituals of Freemasons were small morality plays learnt by heart and recited by memory. Ritual is perhaps a supreme form of gaming which enables us to escape a technology, technological and industrial amnesia. Masonic symbolism is a further form of social memory. The tracing boards used by Masons explain their view of the development of civilization and morality. And these richly symbolic uh, objects are a different form of gaming. And it's that sort of symbolization, that sort of memorialization that I think suggest ways in which we can reimagine communication. Thank you. Stop the share. Oh, thank you.